All right. Well, Shabbat Shalom. And uh, at this season, I can say what my father-in-law, blessed memory said, he is risen. And he would enthusiastically answer, he is risen indeed. The resurrection day we mark tomorrow, but we are in the season. And um, I want to share something about that. You're going to hear a lot about Messiah's death and resurrection and what that means to the world. But what I expect (laughs) is that I'm going to create more questions than answers with this message. But you'll get a little bit of where my spiritual journey is. And uh, hopefully it'll help you with yours. So, Father, may you be glorified and honored by these words. Thank you for what you have taught us from your word. May we continue to have teachable hearts and humble hearts and walk down this path together as your people, the sheep of your pastor, the pastor. We pray this in Yeshua's name. Amen. All right, I've asked this before. Does the world need Messiah? Yes. Does, and did Messiah Yeshua atone for the willful, rebellious sins of the whole world? Are we sure? I mean, tell me, folks. <laughs> yes. Did he open the way to relationship with our creator for every man, woman, and child? Of every era, on every continent, from every people, and of every nation? Yes. Did his death and resurrection make that much of a difference in the condition and destiny of humanity? If we've grown up in the church, any part of the church that regards the Bible as the authoritative word of the creator, then our answers to all of these questions is yes. Yes. And even those who have not grown up in the church profess these things if they've pledged their faith and allegiance to Messiah Yeshua, or Jesus Christ as most of us first came to know him. We gladly extend salvation to all people everywhere, or at least that's what we would say. In practice, it's not quite that easy. And let's be honest, there are, there are people whom we would rather not see in the kingdom of heaven. The list of undesirables starts with the annoying people in our lives. And then it expands to our enemies, foreign and domestic. So we have to ask, does our faith in Jesus have room for Russians and Chinese? For criminals and prostitutes? For Muslims and Buddhists? And even for people of alternate lifestyles, all of whom may not yet have embraced Jesus, but at least in theory, are invited to enter his kingdom and allow him to transform them by his new covenant heart change. Do we have room for all these people? Be careful how you answer that question. Because whether we say yes or no, God hears and holds us accountable for our words. That's a consistent message of Scripture. Our ancestors, going back to Adam and Eve, have ignored or forgotten or missed that message, and we ourselves are prone to make the same error. It's a common human condition, and that's why, that's why we need a Savior who can reconcile us to our Creator, even in our hostile ignorance to the Creator's thoughts and ways. It's common knowledge that Christianity sprang from Judaism. We who call ourselves Messianic, Torah observant, Hebrew roots, or pronomian, we understand this. We walk out a faith in the Messiah who taught the Torah of Moses and walked it out as an example to us all. That should give us a positive view of the Jewish people who are the visible remnant of God's covenant nation of Israel. That's what Paul writes about in Ephesians 2 when he refers to us non-Jews as Gentiles in the flesh who are now part of the commonwealth of Israel. The death and resurrection of Israel's Messiah has opened the way not only for every person everywhere to enter fellowship with our Creator, 
but also to enter fellowship with one another. That's what Paul means about Messiah breaking down the wall of separation between us, creating one new or renewed man from those who in his day were called uncircumcision and circumcision. As Paul says in Ephesians 2, and he came and proclaimed shalom to you who were far away and shalom to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by the same spirit, the same ruach, So then you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. You have been built on the foundation made up of the emissaries, the apostles, and the prophets, with Messiah Yeshua himself being the cornerstone. In him, the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple for the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into God's dwelling place in the Spirit. By the way, I'm using the Tree of Life version for the Scriptures. That's one of my favorite translations, at least right now. I've had many, but praise God for those who translated the Word into the languages we understand. All right, so if Paul says this is true, if what Paul says is true, that we who are from the nations are joined by Messiah into his covenant nation of Israel and are being made one new people. Why is it that for nearly 2,000 years the church has said that the Jews are cursed of God because they killed the Messiah? Even when we reject that line of thinking, we still insist that the only way they can come into a relationship with the Almighty is the same way we did, by publicly confessing Jesus as Lord and Savior. And then we insist that they leave behind everything Jewish, the Sabbath, the feasts, all the commandments of Torah. In essence, we insist that they discard their identity as Jews. This is the kind of thinking that I call the spirit of the Inquisition. It's the spirit behind the replacement theology that has shaped Christian-Jewish relations for two millennia. To this day, Jews are, for the most part, fearful and suspicious of Christians, which in their minds includes Messianic and Hebrew roots believers. You know, they all think we're medieval Catholics. I mean, seriously. Don't ask them the difference between a Baptist and a Presbyterian. They don't know. Any more than you know the difference between the Hasidim and the Reformed and the conservative Jews. Because we don't know each other. See, their expectation is that we are continuing in the same spirit that demanded their ancestors leave Judaism and convert to Christianity. And if they refused, give them the choice of death or expulsion. This is why Jews, both observant and secular, want nothing to do with our Jewish, uh, Jesus. Yet it's clear that God has a purpose for them. They are the house of Judah, the visible remnant of the covenant nation of Israel, and the bearer of God's promises to redeem all nations. The church, meaning Christianity in all its various forms, including Messianic and Hebrew roots believers, is the other part of Israel comprised mostly of non-Jews whose divine mission is to go into all the world and carry the good news of redemption in Messiah. That's how all the nations are drawn into this covenant. And that's why many of us believe the church is the reconstituted house of Israel, also known in Scripture as the house of Joseph. The key point under consideration today is how to be reconciled with our Jewish brethren. Is there a way we can set aside for the moment our insistence that they accept Jesus on our terms so that together we can do the work God has intended his covenant people to do all along? Well, let's see if the scripture has anything to help us in this quest for reconciliation. We can start with the covenant of death. Isaiah explains that Israel had made such a covenant. Therefore, hear the word of Adonai, you scoffers, who rule this people who are in Jerusalem. 
Because you have said, we cut a covenant with death. We made a pact with Sheol, the grave. So when the overflowing scourge passes through, it won't come for us, for we have made lies our refuge and hid ourselves in falsehood. Therefore, thus says Adonai Elohim, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone, a firm foundation. Whoever trusts will not flee in haste, but I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the plumb line. Hail will sweep away the refuge of lies and water will overflow the hiding place. Your covenant with death is annulled and your pact with Sheol will not stand. An overflowing scourge will pass through and you will be its trampling place. Now, this wasn't just Israel's problem. The world established this covenant at the Garden of Eden when our first ancestors accepted the serpent's counsel and rebelled against God's commands. They chose death rather than life. And humanity ever since has been inclined to make the same choice. Now, what made the problem worse was that God had established Israel as the vehicle by which he would return the nations to life. But his covenant nation had also chosen death. By the time Isaiah proclaimed this promise, the northern kingdom of Israel had been destroyed and scattered by Assyria. And all that was left was Judah. And they were to be destroyed by Babylon and carried into exile a little over a century later. Even the sobering spectacle of Israel's destruction did not present, prevent Judah's leaders from continuing down the same path. Since they would not or could not annul their covenant with death, God himself would do it. Now, God takes oaths seriously. His universe operates on laws and standards that must apply to everyone equally if they do not then the universe ceases to function as the creator intended. And his willingness and ability to rule it comes into question. That's a little metaphysical reasoning to show you how important this drama here on earth is for the whole of creation. See, that's why words mean things, even words spoken to our own hurt. Solomon addressed this in the Proverbs. Death and life are in the control of the tongue. Those who indulge in it will eat its fruit. And Yeshua also testified to this principle according to Matthew. But I tell you that on the day of judgment, the men will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Scripture gives us examples of this principle in action. Let's consider two of them, starting with the story of Esau the firstborn son of Isaac, and heir to the covenant birthright of Abraham's family. As a young man, Esau placed a higher value on filling his stomach than on his birthright. So he agreed to his brother Jacob's offer to sell him a bowl of stew in exchange for his position in the family. And that choice made on a whim by a youth was binding in God's eyes and in the eyes of his family. As we read in Genesis When the boys grew up, Esau became a man knowledgeable in hunting, an outdoorsman, while Jacob was a mild man remaining in tents. Now Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for wild game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Now Jacob cooked a stew. When Esau came in from the field, he was exhausted, so Esau said to Jacob, please feed me some of this really red stuff because I'm exhausted. And that's why he is called Edom, or Red. So Jacob said, sell me, sell your birthright to me today. Esau said, look, I'm about to die of whatever use is this to me, a birthright. Jacob said, make a pledge to me now. So he made a pledge to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank. Then he got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Now, years later, Jacob and his mother, Rebekah, relied on that transaction 
as justification for Jacob to deceive his father Isaac and receive the birthright blessing. And that's why the lineage of God's covenant people goes through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. It sounds unfair to our modern ears, but the writer of Hebrews testifies that God himself considers Esau's foolish youthful oath as binding. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God, and see to it that no bitter root springs up and causes trouble, and by it many be defiled. Also see to it that there is no immoral or godless person like Esau who sold his birthright for one meal, for you know that later when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. He found no chance for repentance, though he begged for it with tears. God really does take our words seriously. King David learned that in the affair of the Gibeonites. Now, that story began centuries earlier when Israel under Joshua's leadership was conquering the promised land of Canaan. God had commanded them to drive out all the inhabitants of Canaan, but Joshua and the elders of Israel made a covenant of peace with the Canaanite people in the city of Gibeon. The account is in Joshua 9. The Gibeonites had heard about the power of Israel's God in bringing them out of Egypt and in leading them to victory over Jericho and other Canaanite strongholds. Their leaders realized that they too would be destroyed if they didn't find a way to make peace with Israel. And knowing that the Israelites would not conclude a peace with any Canaanite city, they staged an elaborate deception to convince Israel's leaders that they weren't Canaanites, but had come from a distant country. The deception worked. The Israelites chose to make a covenant of peace with the Gibeonites before they consulted God and against God's specific instructions. And then three days later, the Israelites learned the truth. Uh, The people were ready to destroy the Gibeonite cities, but their leaders wouldn't allow it. Because of the covenant. Here's how the matter matter was settled according to Joshua 9. Then the entire community murmured against the leaders, but all the leaders answered the entire community, we have sworn to them by Adonai, God of Israel, so now we cannot touch them. This is what we'll do to them. We will let them live lest wrath be upon us because of the oath which we swore to them. Yes, let them live, the leaders said further. But let them chop wood and draw water for the entire community. So the leaders decreed concerning them. And then Joshua summoned them and he spoke to them saying, Why have you deceived us saying we are very far from you when you are living among us? Now therefore you're cursed and you'll never cease to be servants, wood choppers and water carriers for the house of my God. So they answered Joshua and said, It was because your servants were clearly told that Adonai your God had commanded his servant Moses to give you all the land and to destroy all the inhabitants of the land before you. So we were very afraid for our lives because of you. And so we did this. Now behold, we are in your hand. Whatever seems good and right in your eyes to do to us do. Thus he did to them, delivering them delivering them from the hand of the children of Israel, so they did not slay them. On that day, Joshua made them wood choppers and water carriers for the community and for the altar of Adonai in the place which he would choose. So it is this day. Now, even though this covenant was made with deception, God considered it binding on Israel. He enforced it on behalf of the Gibeonites 400 years later during David's reign. We read that story in 2 Samuel, chapter 21. Now, there was famine in the days of David for three years, year after year, so that David sought the face of Adonai. Adonai replied, it is because of Saul and his bloody house, for he put the Gibeonites to death. So he summoned, the king summoned the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now, the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but a remnant of the Amorites. However, the children of Israel had sworn a covenant with them, yet Saul had tried to eradicate them in his zeal 
for the children of Israel, B'nai Yisrael and Judah. David asked the Gibeonites, what should I do for you? How may I make atonement so that you would bless the inheritance of Adonai? And the Gibeonites said to him, it's not a matter of silver or gold between us and Saul or his house, nor is it right to put any man to death in Israel. Whatever you say, I will do for you, he said. Then they said to the king, the man who consumed us and plotted against us to annihilate us from remaining in any of Israel's territory, let seven men of his sons be given over to us, and we will hang them up before Adonai at Gibeah of Saul, Adonai's chosen. I will give them over, the king said. So they hanged them on the hill before Adonai so that all seven fell together. They were put to death during the days of harvest at the beginning of the barley harvest. They did all of what the king commanded, and afterward God was moved to prayer by prayer for the land. In my studies of history, I've encountered many stories like this. But the victims very often had no advocate like the one who insisted for justice for the heathen Gibeonites. Because of what they'd heard about Israel's God, the Gibeonites chose perpetual servitude over certain destruction. Servitude that required them to be near the presence of the Almighty as they brought wood and water to the tabernacle. Did they learn his ways there? Did any of them forsake the ways of their gods and join themselves to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Perhaps they did. But even if not, God's people had made a vow that bound them and their God by honor to preserve the lives of the Gibeonites. And that's why the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob pled their cause when his people chose to break their covenant and shame his name. Now that should make us tremble as we remember covenants we have broken. Our God is serious about this. He intends for us to keep our word just as he keeps his. That's a big part of what makes reconciliation possible. But what about this covenant with death? If we keep our word, how can that covenant be broken? And how does our covenant-keeping God propose to annul it? We know in part that he triumphed over death in the grave when he became one of us, took the penalty of our covenant with death, and then returned to life. He gave humanity a fresh start. And that's what we know from the testimony of Scripture and the testimony of people like us who have accepted his invitation to life. Yet we don't know the full counsel of God. His ways really are beyond our understanding. From our finite mortal perspective, his will appears counterintuitive and even contradictory. He does intend to deliver Israel and the nations from the covenant with death. But his methods don't always seem logical or right to us. Now let's consider two more scriptural examples, starting with Egypt's Pharaoh. God raised up that leader specifically for the purpose of demonstrating his power and glory as Moses and Paul both testify from Moses. Then Adonai said to Moses, rise up early in the morning. Stand before Pharaoh and say to him, this is what Adonai, the God of the Hebrews, says. Let my people go so they may serve me. For this time I will send all my plagues to your heart and on your servants and on your people so that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. Surely by now I could have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with a plague that would have wiped you off the earth. However... I've let you stand for this reason, to show you my power and that my name might be proclaimed throughout all the earth. Yet still you exalt yourself over my people by not letting them go. Paul says, what shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. For to Moses he says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it doesn't depend on the one who wills or the one who strives, but on God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up, to demonstrate my power in you, 
so my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Then there's the example of Messiah Yeshua. The Son of God became human for the purpose of suffering death so that mankind could be redeemed. That was God's plan for counseling the covenant with death. Yet it wasn't clear to his disciples. Even when Peter proclaimed Yeshua as Messiah, he still didn't ever understand everything that meant. From Matthew 16, Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Yeshua said to him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also tell you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my community, and the gates of Sheol will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will have been forbidden in heaven, and what you permit on earth will have been permitted in heaven. And then he ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. And from that time on, Yeshua began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the ruling Kohanim, the priests, and the Torah scholars, and be killed and be raised on the third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Never, Master, this must never happen to you. But he turned back and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but the things of men. Bad things were about to happen to Yeshua. Bad enough that even he asks that they may not happen if possible. And yet those bad things were part of the Creator's will. It was with his permission that the forces of evil triumphed that night in Gethsemane, according to the Gospels. Luke 22, and Yeshua came out and went as usual to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples followed him, and when he reached the place, he said to them, pray that you will not enter into temptation. And he pulled back about a stone's throw from them, got on his knees and began to pray, saying, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will but yours be done. See, that's what Yeshua prayed before the authorities came to arrest him. The actions of his disciples when the authorities arrived indicates that they still did not understand God's will for the Messiah. Moving to Matthew, while Yeshua was still speaking, here came Judah, one of the twelve, and with him a big crowd with swords and clubs from the ruling priests and elders of the people. Now his betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I kiss, he is the one, seize him. And immediately Judah drew near to Yeshua and said, shalom, Rabbi, and kissed him. Friend, Yeshua said, do what you've come to do. Then they came up and threw their hands on Yeshua and seized him. And suddenly, one of those with Yeshua reached, stretched out his hand and drew his sword, and he struck the Kohen Gadol's servant, the high priest's servant, and cut, his, cut off his ear. Then Yeshua said to him, put back your sword in its place, for all who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Or do you suppose that I cannot call on my father? And at once he will place at my side 12 legions of angels. How then would the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? Luke goes on to say, Then Yeshua said to the ruling priests, officers of the, of the temple guard and the elders who had come against him, Have you come out with swords and clubs as you would against a revolutionary? Every day I was with you in the temple, and yet you did not lay a finger on me. But this is yours, the hour and the power of darkness." And then they seized Yeshua and led him away and brought him into the house of the high priest. But Peter was following from a distance. One of those who agreed with the decision to arrest Yeshua was a Jewish scholar named Saul of Tarsus, whose Greek name was Paul. After Paul had a decisive encounter with the risen Messiah, he testified not only to the necessity of Yeshua's suffering, but he encouraged his fellow believers to follow Yeshua's example. To the Galatians, he writes, Paul, an emissary, sent not from men 
or by man, but by Yeshua the Messiah and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers with me to Messiah's communities of Galatia, grace to you and shalom from God our Father and our Lord Yeshua the Messiah who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And then Paul writes to the Philippians, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Messiah Yeshua, who, though existing in the form of God, did not consider being equal to God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself, taking on the form of a slave, becoming the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Yeshua every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue profess that Yeshua is Messiah, the Messiah is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul could write these things with confidence because he understood that Yeshua's blood is the means by which the Almighty cancels the covenant with death. His testimony is added to the testimony of the other apostles who willingly laid down their lives professing this truth. Here's some of what they share with us through their letters from John. Now, this is the message we've heard from him and announced to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and keep walking in the darkness, we are lying and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of his son Yeshua purifies us from all sin. From Paul, therefore keep in mind that once you, Gentiles in the flesh, were called uncircumcision by those called circumcision, which is performed on the flesh by hand, At that time, you were separate from Messiah, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Messiah Yeshua, you, who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of the Messiah. From the writer of Hebrews, Now may the God of Shalom who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of an everlasting covenant, our Lord Yeshua, make you complete in every good thing to do his will, accomplishing in us what is pleasing in his sight through Messiah Yeshua. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Then we hear from Peter. Peter, an emissary of Messiah Yeshua to the sojourners of the diaspora, in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, set apart by the Ruach, the Spirit, for obedience and for sprinkling with the blood of Yeshua the Messiah, may grace and shalom be multiplied to you. And again from John, to Messiah's seven communities in Asia, grace to you and shalom from him who is and who was and who is to come, as well as from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Messiah Yeshua, the faithful witness and firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever. Amen. Now, what does all of this mean for Jews and Gentiles? or as many believe, Judah and Joseph. Are Jews and Christians the two houses of Israel? It's not necessary for us to be in agreement on that subject. But we do not need to find a way in which these two parts of God's covenant people can be reconciled. Our destinies in Messiah's kingdom are intertwined. And fulfillment of his kingdom promises hinges on our mutual respect as we walk out these promises together. Yeshua is the Messiah of the whole world, both Jews and Gentiles. The problem is 
neither Jews nor Gentiles seem to recognize that this redemption applies to both. So perhaps we should start by considering that the world isn't divided into Jews and Gentiles, but Israel and the nations. The word Gentile is from the Greek word ethnos, which means nations. Everyone who is in the covenant is part of Israel, regardless whether they are born Jews or born in the nations. All of us become children of God, as Paul explains in Galatians 4. But when the fullness of time came, God sent out his son, born of a woman and born under law, to free those under law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Now, because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts who cries out, Abba, Father. The way we came out of the covenant with death and into God's covenant of life is through the blood of Yeshua. Ironically, the high priest who condemned Yeshua to death prophesied that. It's written in John 11. So the ruling priests and Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin the ruling council. What are we doing, they asked. This man is performing many signs. If if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our holy place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing. You don't take into account that it is better for you that one man die for the people rather than for the whole nation to be destroyed. Now, he didn't say this by himself, but as the high priest that year, he prophesied that Yeshua would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also so that he might gather together into one the scattered children of God. So from that day on, they plotted to kill him. Therefore, Yeshua no longer walked openly among the Judeans, but went from there to a country near the wilderness to a city called Ephraim. He stayed there with his disciples. Now, we understand how this works for people from the nations who become, became the non-Jewish part of Israel. If you take a two-house approach, we from the nations are the house of Joseph. Fortunately, we don't have to have full understanding or agreement on that point. What we do have to understand is that our father did not exclude the Jewish people from this covenant. Saving Judah was God's intent all along. Hosea said in the same chapter where he spoke of the judgment and redemption of the house of Israel, the northern kingdom, Hosea's wife and children were the visual signs of this prophecy. Hosea won, then she conceived again and bore a daughter, and he said to him, name her Lo Ruhema, no mercy, for I no longer will I have compassion on the house of Israel that I should ever pardon them. But on the house of Judah, I will have compassion and deliver them by Adonai their God, yet not by bow, sword, or battle, nor by horses and horsemen. Salvation has no time limit. Since God exists outside of time, he can bring about his will at any point in human history. We finite human beings have trouble understanding this, but the apostles teach about it. The work was already accomplished when God established the world, but it wasn't revealed until the time was right. John writes in Revelation 13:8, according to some translations, about the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. Peter explains that a little more clearly. If you call on him as father, the one who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, then live out the time of sojourning in reverent fear. You know that you were redeemed from the futile way of life handed down from your ancestors, not with perishable things such as silver and gold, but with precious blood like that of a lamb without defect or spot, the blood of Messiah. He was chosen before the foundation of the world but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your trust and hope are in God. 
This is the bedrock of our faith as Christians. Both the older established denominations and the new streams of Messianic, Hebraic, and Pronomian believers. Jesus, Yeshua, is everything for us. Yet he's quite the opposite for Jews. So how can the Jewish people still have a kingdom destiny since their ancestors rejected Jesus and most Jews continue to do so today? This is the sticking point. Scripture and our own testimonies are clear that Jesus is the way to the Father. But it, could it be that even though everyone, Jew and Gentile, is saved by Jesus' blood, there might be something bigger at work that we don't completely understand? Is there a reason God would have wanted to preserve the Jewish people as they are, keeping Torah as best they know how, even though they do not acknowledge that Yeshua has paid the price for the sins of the world. There may be something in Matthew's account of Yeshua's trial before Pontius Pilate that can help us. Consider Matthew 27, starting at verse 11. Now Yeshua stood before the governor, Pilate. The governor questioned him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? You say so, Yeshua said. And... While he was accused by the ruling priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, don't you hear how many things they testify against you? Yeshua did not answer, not even one word, so the governor was greatly amazed. Now during the feast, the governor was accustomed to release to the crowd one prisoner, anyone they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Yeshua bar Abba, Barabbas in most translations. So when they were gathered together, Pilate said to them, which one do you want me to release to, for you? Yeshua who is Barabba or Yeshua who is called Messiah? For he knew that they had handed him over out of envy. While Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him a message saying, don't have anything to do with that righteous man for today I've suffered many things in a dream because of him. Now the ruling priests and the elders persuaded the crowds that they should ask for Bar Abba and destroy Yeshua. But the governor responded, which of the two do you want me to release to you? And they said, Bar Abba. Stop for a moment. What is the meaning of the name Bar Abba or Barabbas? It means son of the father. So that means this Jewish crowd cried out to Pilate, give us the son of the father. So let's continue in Matthew. Pilate said to them, what then shall I do with Yeshua who is called Messiah? Execute him, all of them say. But Pilate said, why? What evil has he done? But they kept shouting all the more, let him be executed. In most English translations, the second demand by the crowd is, let him be crucified. That, of course, is how Yeshua was executed. But the question of the moment is, was that contrary to the will of God? No. We've already seen that God the Father intended for his son to die for the sins of the world. So then, the Jewish crowd expressed agreement with the will of the Father. Back to Matthew. When Pilate saw he was accomplishing nothing, but instead a riot was starting, he took some of the water and washed hands, his hands in front of the crowd. I'm innocent of this blood, he said. You see to it yourselves. And the people answered and said, his blood be on us and on our children. Now the third demand by the crowd. His blood be on us and on our children. What is it that the blood of Messiah Yeshua does? It's the means by which we are saved. So then, this Jewish crowd was demanding for themselves and for their children, their descendants, that the blood of the Lamb cover them. And with that, Pilate made his decision. Then he released to them Barabbas, and after he had Yeshua scourged, he handed them over to be crucified. Words mean things. The Jewish crowd assembled before the Roman governor didn't know exactly what they were saying. 
and neither did the leaders who urged them on. Nevertheless, God knew. Their words carried meaning, just as the words of Esau and of Joshua carried meaning. When they entered into covenants, they did not understand. So what did the Jewish crowd say? Give us the son of the father. Let him be crucified. His blood be on us and on our children. What does this mean for the salvation of the Jewish people? Do they still need to accept Jesus as we would define it? Honestly, I don't know. What I do know is that the blood shed by the Lamb of God on the cross is what permits us to relate to our Jewish brothers and sisters as family, regardless of our differences. As my friend Rabbi Chaim Eisen says, the key for us all is to be faithful to him, which means I'm to be faithful as a committed Christian, and he is to be faithful as a committed Jew. We on this side of the family cling firmly to Yeshua the Messiah, the Son of God, Son of Man, and Son of David, because our identity is in him. We freely share the story of our identity with all who would like to know. And that's the right thing to do. With this in mind, let us recognize that our Jewish brethren are worshipers of the same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as we are. And they have remained true to the covenant as best they know how through the ages. Worship team, if you want to come up. See, this is the spirit of reconciliation. It's the way we can, understand, can connect on a basis of mutual respect and understanding. We don't have to understand how observant, righteous Jews have a relationship with the Almighty, just as they don't have to understand our allegiance to the Messiah who brought us into relationship with the same Almighty. All we have to do is recognize that God is doing something grand and leave it to Him to reveal it to us all in time. And that's how the Son of Man will find faith on the earth when he comes. Let's pray. Our Father and our King, we do thank you that your ways are above our ways, your thoughts above our thoughts. And we do release to you our desire to have things our own way and shape things according to our own understanding. No, Father, your ways are better even when we don't understand. So to you be all the glory forever and ever. Amen. If you have need of prayer, please come up. We have a prayer team on either side. God bless you all. Shema Israel Adonai God, the Lord is one. Blessed is the name of his glorious kingdom for all eternity. Hallelujah. May the patient, may the God of patience and encouragement grant you to be like-minded with one another in the manner of our Messiah, Messiah, so that together with one voice you glorify the God and Father of our Lord Yeshua, the Messiah. May the Lord bless you and may he keep you, and may the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance toward you and give you his shalom. Hallelujah. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Shalom. We pray this message has blessed and encouraged you and your relationship with God. And we hope that it has made the Bible more beautiful and more powerful in its impact in your life. Founded in Truth Fellowship exists to build a community that bears the image of God and lives the redeemed life only Yeshua gives. If this message has blessed you 
or if you see God working in and through this ministry, we invite you to prayerfully consider partnering with us so that the message of Yeshua and the truth of God's word continues to reach all nations. If you would like to take part in this mission, then you can do so at foundinintruth.com slash give, or you can scan the QR code on the screen. These offerings go toward providing resources for both our local fellowship as well as our online ministry, but also our many outreach ministries, including our foster care and adoption ministry, local charity outreach ministry, our international online children's ministry, and any future ministries that the Lord would allow us to walk through and walk in to impact the world around us with His love and the bold proclamation of the gospel of King Yeshua. We thank you for your continued support, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Shalom.